Today, we will look at the different methods, systems, and techniques used for air navigation. But first, let's see what is air navigation. It is defined as a set of techniques used to determine the position of an aircraft, allowing it to move along a predetermined trajectory, which is called route. In simpler words, we can say that it is the process of piloting an aircraft from one place to another, while monitoring and controlling its position as the flight progresses. Now, air navigation differs from other types of navigation in that aircraft fly at relatively high speeds, and in most cases they do not have the ability to stop in midair. With this being said, the basic objectives of air navigation are to determine where you are, where you want to go, which is the most suitable and convenient route between those two points, and how much time and fuel it will take to get there. In order to answer these questions, it is necessary to take into account factors such as weather, airspace structure, aircraft performance, terrain and obstacles, and all applicable rules and regulations. In relation to these regulations, there are two types of flight rules that can be used. The visual flight rules or VFR, and the instrument flight rules or IFR. When flying under VFR rules, the pilot has to navigate using visual references, which implies that visibility must be good. On the other hand, when flying under IFR, the pilot shall navigate by reference to the instruments in the cockpit, which means that the aircraft can operate in low visibility conditions. This way, the navigation methods and systems to be used during the flight will depend in part on the flight rules under which the aircraft is flying. Having seen these definitions and considerations, let's now look at the methods of air navigation, starting with pilotage. This is the simplest and oldest form of air navigation, and it is based on the observation of visual references to navigate. These visual references can be landmarks, cities, towns, rivers, lakes, highways, railways, or any other significant reference that can be seen from the aircraft. Now, since it is necessary to identify these visual references, this method of navigation is limited to good visibility conditions, which are known as VMC or Visual Meteorological Conditions. Let's look at an example of pilotage navigation. Suppose an aircraft wants to fly from Airport A to Airport B, and in between there are several visual references that can be used by the pilot to orient himself and find his way to the destination. In this particular case, let's say that the aircraft takes off and flies to the east until it reaches these rocky mountains, where it turns to the northeast following the river until it reaches town number one. Then it flies to the east following the shoreline until it reaches town number two, where it turns to the southeast following the highway until it reaches town number three, where the pilot sights the airport be, and then proceeds to land. So as we can see, in order to apply this method of navigation it is necessary to be familiar with the area, or to have a detailed navigation chart in order to properly identify the visual references to be used. However, this is a very rudimentary method of navigation, so to complement it, another method known as dead reckoning is normally used. Dead reckoning navigation is based on the calculation of heading, distance, and time between visual reference points. And as already mentioned, it is used in conjunction with pilotage in VFR flights. Now, in order to apply dead reckoning, a pre-flight preparation of the route is necessary to calculate the headings, distances, and times. To do this, the pilot normally uses a VFR navigation chart of the area, a plotter, a flight computer, and a navigation log to manually calculate all the necessary information. However, nowadays there are mobile applications that perform these calculations automatically, but we will not go into detail with this. Let's now look at an example of dead reckoning navigation. Suppose an aircraft wants to fly from Airport A to Airport B, and during the flight preparation the pilot decides to use two towns as visual reference points. In this case, using the navigation chart and the plotter, the pilot determines the headings and distances to be flown for each leg. With this information, and knowing the speed of the aircraft in relation to the ground, the pilot can use the flight computer or a formula to determine the flight time for each leg. 
In this case, after taking off from Airport A, the aircraft flies with heading 060 for 13 minutes, after this time has elapsed, the aircraft should be over town number 1, so the pilot confirms the position visually, and then turns right to heading 085 for another 9 minutes. After this time has elapsed, the aircraft should be over town number 2, so the pilot confirms that visually and turns right to heading 150 for another 7 minutes, and after this time has elapsed, the aircraft must be over the airport B. Now, the calculated parameters of heading, speed and time can be affected by the wind, so it is important to correct these values depending on the wind direction and speed. Let's now look at the radio navigation, also known as conventional navigation. This is a navigation method for IFR flights that is based on the use of ground-based radio navades. The most common navades are the VOR, the DME, the NDB, and the ILS. And in order to use these navades, certified onboard equipment is required. In this example, the aircraft wants to fly from Airport A to Airport B. And in between there are some navades. In this case, the radio navigation chart of the area determines the headings, distances, and minimum altitudes to be used for each route segment between the navades. And in some cases, navades such as the VORDME allow other types of procedures to be designed, such as DME arcs or establishing fixes. Now, it is important to note that most IFR procedures and route networks are based on radio navigation, so all IFR-equipped aircraft are capable of radio navigating. Now, an important consideration is that to radio navigate it is required to be within the coverage of the navades to be used. In this example we can see that it is not possible to fly from the navade 1 to the navade 3 directly, since there is a part of the route where there is no coverage. This way, the aircraft has to fly first to the navade 2 and then to the navade 3. With this in mind, aircraft flying in remote or oceanic areas will have no coverage, so in those cases radio navigation is not an option. Now, sometimes there are changes in the navades, the radio navigation routes, or the procedures of an airport, so it is important to have the updated charts for the area and the aerodromes where it is intended to fly. So having seen the radio navigation, let's continue with the GNSS, which stands for Global Navigation Satellite System. Also known as Satellite Navigation, this is one of the most widely used systems today, both for IFR and VFR navigation, and it is based on the use of satellite signals to determine the current position and navigate. These signals are emitted by a constellation of satellites orbiting the Earth. And it is important to mention that there is more than one GNSS system, so each one has its own satellite's constellation. One of the best known worldwide is GPS, which is managed by the United States. However, there are other GNSS systems such as GLONASS from Russia, Galileo from the European Union, Beidou from China, IRNSS from India, and QZSS from Japan. Of these systems, both GPS and GLONASS have augmentation systems that increase the accuracy and reliability. These augmentation systems can be ground-based, aircraft-based, or satellite-based, but we will not go into detail with these. Let's look at a quick example of how satellite signals are used to determine the position of an aircraft on the Earth. The method used by the GNSS is called trilateration, and it is based on measuring the distance between the aircraft and the satellites. For example, let's say that we are receiving signals from three GNSS satellites at the same time. In this case, let's say the distance measured between the aircraft and the satellite number one is 2,000 kilometers. This means that the aircraft could be at any point on this circumference. Now, let's say that the distance measured to the satellite number 2 is 1,900 kilometers. With this information, we are now sure that the aircraft has to be in one of these two places. So to know in which of them it is really located, we need to know the distance to a third satellite. Let's say for example that the distance measured to the satellite number 3 is 1,800 kilometers. With this, we can now determine that the aircraft is in this position. 
This process is constantly performed by the GNSS receiver, which determines the position of the aircraft in terms of geographic coordinates, and then locates the aircraft on the map of the GNSS device. Let's see a practical example. Suppose an aircraft wants to fly from the airport A to the airport B, using a route that passes through waypoints determined by certain geographic coordinates. In this case, it is necessary to have an updated aeronautical database known as ARAC, which stands for Aeronautical Information Regulation and Control. This database contains the geographic coordinates of each airfield, navaid and waypoint to be used for air navigation. This way, the GNSS equipment will determine the aircraft's current position and allow it to navigate to the waypoints defined in the route. And basically that's how satellite navigation works. Having seen this, let's continue with the INS, which stands for Inertial Navigation System. It is considered as a self-contained navigation system, since it does not require any information or signals from external systems or ground-based navades to operate. It is based on the use of gyroscopes and accelerometers, which act as motion and rotation sensors. This way, the system measures the acceleration and rotation of the aircraft in each of the axes, and based on that information it calculates data such as heading, distance traveled, and speed. This means that starting from a known initial position where the INS is aligned, and knowing the parameters of speed, heading and elapsed time, the system can accurately estimate the position of the aircraft as it flies. Now, the estimated position is calculated in terms of geographic coordinates, so it is also necessary to have an updated ARAC for this system to work properly. It is also important to bear in mind that the INS accuracy reduces over time, due to the accumulation of measurement errors from the sensors. Another navigation system is the Lorentz C, which is a long-range navigation system that is based on the use of radio signals emitted from antennas on the ground. It was one of the pioneers of oceanic long-range navigation, but nowadays it tends to disappear, as there are more accurate and global systems such as GNSS. The Loren uses the same principle of trilateration of the GNSS, the difference is that the signals are emitted from ground-based antennas instead of satellites. This implies that it is not very accurate, and there are often problems getting reception from the required antennas. This is why this system is practically obsolete today. Nowadays, one of the most widely used navigation methods is the ARNAV, which stands for Area Navigation. This navigation method integrates several systems to improve its accuracy and reliability. It is based on receiving and processing information from various navigation systems to determine the current position and navigate. Currently approved ARNAV sensors are VORDME, DMEDME, INS, GNSS, and Lorentz. This means in other words that ARNAV takes information from all these systems to accurately determine the current position of the aircraft. So compared to the use of individual systems, ARNAV is much more accurate and reliable. Let's see an example of ARNAV navigation. In practical terms it would work exactly as satellite navigation, the difference would be that the current position of the aircraft is determined based on several navigation systems and not only GNSS. Now, due to its accuracy and reliability, a variety of ARNAV procedures have been developed, which are much more efficient than those used in radio navigation. Now, a system derived from the ARNAV is the RNP, which stands for Required Navigation Performance. It consists basically on an ARNAV system that incorporates a navigation performance monitoring and alerting system. When we say navigation performance, we are referring primarily to the accuracy of the system. So, RNP allows to know the current accuracy of the system and also alerts the crew when the required accuracy limit is exceeded. With this, since RNP has higher precision requirements, it allows to fly curved paths and not only straight paths as in the case of ARNAV or other navigation methods. This functionality is known as radius to fix and is available only in some advanced RNP systems. Let's look at an example of RNP navigation. As we already said, this is basically the same as ARNAV navigation, 
The difference is that the accuracy is constantly monitored, and in some cases the aircraft is capable of following curved paths. Now, RNP is widely used in the design of complex approach and departure procedures, due to its excellent performance and accuracy requirements. This way, flight procedures can be optimized to increase efficiency as we can see in this example. Here we can see the comparison between conventional radio navigation procedures, the RNAV and the RNP with radius to fix functionality. Now, a concept related to RNAV and RNP is PBN, which stands for Performance-Based Navigation. PBN establishes the specifications and standards that regulate RNAV and RNP operations. PBN was created to regulate the accuracy, integrity, availability, continuity, and functionality requirements of the RNAV and RNP systems, depending on the type of operation to be performed. This way, there are different RNAV and RNP navigation specifications. In most cases, the number of the specification represents the required lateral accuracy in terms of nautical miles. However, there are some specifications such as RNP approach and RNP AR approach, which has specific accuracy requirements for each phase of the procedure. Now, an aircraft can fly under different navigation specifications on the same flight, all depending on the accuracy requirements of the route, airspace, or procedure. Here for example, during the departure, the aircraft flies under RNP-1. Then, during cruise it flies under RNP-2. During the arrival it reduces again to RNP-1. And finally during the approach, since a high accuracy is required, it flies under RNP-0.3. It is important to mention that in order to fly under a certain PBN specification, the aircraft and the crew must be respectively approved. I hope the information presented in this video was useful. If so, don't forget to share, like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. Thanks for watching.